Another welcome to many uh, in this audience, our board members, our cabinet members, our former board members, our council members, uh, our dear friends. Uh, uh, some of you were just at a very interesting lunch, and now you're back. And uh, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, and delighted uh, to introduce the first of this afternoon's very interesting panels. Uh, this is a landmark afternoon for our America's at the Wilson Center initiative. Notice how techy we have become. Uh, and I'm proud to welcome today Chile's ambassador to the United States, Juan Gabriel Valdez. A distinguished diplomat, Ambassador Valdez has held a host of senior posts as Chile's foreign minister, as chief of the UN stabilization mission in Haiti, and as ambassador to the UN while his country sat on the Security Council. He's also, after Woodrow Wilson's own heart, a scholar with a PhD in political science from Princeton University. But most impressive might be his role after years of exile in the US and Mexico in the No campaign that helped, build, that helped bring democracy to Chile after the Pinochet dictatorship. I actually know something about this. I was there on the day of the vote as part of an NDI, National Democratic Institute, delegation of observers. And I remember uh, two of my, very four, of my four children were very young at the time, and my late husband said, you can't go there, it's dangerous. And I said, I have to go there. Uh, the country, this is a, a, you know, a, an enormously important event and I'm very interested and I have to be there. So on the, uh, the, the, the polls were closing, it was late afternoon, and I was standing on a schoolyard in Antofagasta in the north of Chile, and he military helicopters were circling, and the rumor was that the no campaign had been successful. This was a referendum on whether the government should continue. And I was standing there and I thought, my husband was right. Here I am, the mother of a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and I'm going to be gunned down in a schoolyard. Uh, and this is a, just a terrible idea. Well, nothing bad happened. The no campaign won. There was a free election. It was difficult, but there was a free election, and Chile changed forever. And it was a very brave thing uh, that you did, Mr. Ambassador, um, to be in exile and to challenge uh, what was a very... Uh, tough authority in your country. And what I did was sort of brave, but a very small thing compared to what you did. And so uh, we're very proud to host such a committed and brave public servant today. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Juan Gabriel Valdez. Thank you very much to Jane Harmon, President of the Wilson Center, for this generous presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the Wilson Center, let me begin by saying how honored I feel by the invitation of this institution to be the keynote speaker in this important event. This institution has been for years a central Washington player in the examination of region, regional issues and the attraction of Latin American academics into a discussion and exchange with their counterparts in the United States. I have admired its work both as an academic and as a diplomat. I would like to recognize the role Cynthia Arnson has played in the tireless conduction of studies and activities in this center. For a long time, For a long time, she has had the vision to identify the issues, to understand the changing character of our regional politics, as well as the patience and charm required to organize meetings linking different political perspectives and personalities from our sometimes very complex Latin American world. I thank, therefore, the Wilson Center for this opportunity to reflect on the main topics of transparency, governance, and foreign policy in the hemisphere, trying not to go much beyond what is supposed to be the reflections of a diplomat, but not to keep myself behind in, from the analytical freedom that should characterize uh, 
academic thought. My first reflection is that these topics, different as they seem, have linkages that need to be addressed. The question of governance and transparency, the challenges against the legitimacy of the political system, the topic of corruption and the need to strengthen institutions through transparency are very much related to the capacity of the region to incorporate itself into the international system, to integrate its economies in a meaningful manner, to attract investments and regulate themselves into international agreements. Let me refer first to the question of governance and transparency. A few days ago, Sergio Vitar, a distinguished compatriot whom I sure has many friends in this room, said to me in passing, there is a sort of speech today in Latin American countries that if you hear it without knowing to which country it refers, you could always think they are talking about your own country. This is not a good speech. It is the language of mistrust, of rejection of the elite. It is what some call artazgo del abuso, that I am fed up with abuse, inequality and privilege that millions of people in our countries are throwing against the political class and the private sector, the political authority and the elite in general. Each national case is different. The level of the crisis depends very much on the strength of institutions, but the protests and demands are very much the same. Let me say something about my own country. Chile has been a country where corruption has, no, has found no place in the recent decades. At least this is what we thought about ourselves. Today, Chile is going through what I would describe as a democratic crisis. A crisis posing the problem of more participation, more transparency, less privileges, and the eradication of bad business and political price practices which in some cases have amounted to corruption. It is not an institutional crisis. Institutions are working and public opinion wants them to work and to ex excel themselves in the control of bad habits. It is not an economic crisis. Our, economics, our economies have been hit by the end of the commodity boom, but their structures are healthy and foreign investment increased last year in Chile. It is not a social crisis. Students are often in the streets, but there are no masses wanting to attack the Winter Palace. It is a crisis in the development of democracy. It is a crisis that in the end stems from our own success. It is the simultaneous eruption of the middle sectors that resulted from the extraordinary growth of our economy and the social policies it allowed during the last 25 years, and the progressive uncovering of the gross faults in the democratic structure brought to life by the transition to democracy. It would seem as if the entire middle class produced by the remarkable and celebrated transformation that Chile experienced during the last two decades had reacted against the mores and ways of the elite. This is not the result that some, as some would suppose of the present phenomenon of economic stagnation that is affecting many of our countries, particularly those like my own that enjoyed the commodity boom produced by China. It is, on the contrary, related to the enormous success that we achieved, not only during the boom, but also before, mostly as a result of clever, efficient social policies implemented by the state during those years. As President Bachelet said yesterday during her official visit to France, Chileans do not tolerate anymore the bad practices that have characterized the relationship between business and politics in our country. There is no toleration, in other words, for those ambiguous negotiations and controversial electoral pacts that characterize the difficult accommoda accommodation of the transition to democracy. There is no toleration of the conservative sectors when resisting, as they have done for years, every inch in the expansion of democratic participation. 
which does not mean, however, more support to the government or, or to the reformist forces, because as these transitional agreements and practices tended progressively to acquire the character of permanent features of the political system, they led in the perception of citizens to an entanglement of all political actors, both from the right and on the left. The rejection is therefore, in many places, against the whole of the political class. And as the president said, it has concentrated in those cases of corruption which erupted both as a result of deficits in the legal procedures as of the ridiculously high financial costs of political competition and elections. As I said before, however, this is not a destabilizing crisis. There is no institutional crisis. There will be no institutional crisis. Paradoxically, the main risk from this situation is that reforms that were launched precisely to fight inequality and privilege and create the basis for more equal societies might be hampered by political polarization, by hypercriticism, by mistrust. We know, we have learned in Chile, that only big majorities and wide consensus can implement these reforms. Additionally, the second challenge in this situation lays in the extreme concentration on internal politics it produces. Presentism, as the French says, reduces attention to the challenges of development, which are directly linked to the international system. This in Latin America means regional integration and insertion into the global economic system. This is the second topic of our discussion today. Let me also propose some ideas on that. We all agree that the Latin American region is today more diverse and more autonomous than it was, than it was 10 years ago. Its countries are fully related to the world system and have different modes and strategies of international insertion. National diversity is good except in two areas. First, when it signals differences in those commitments on democracy and human rights that all countries in the regions have freely adhered to. Second, when it prevents the capacity of the region to assert itself in international matters that concerns us all and, privates to the, and prevents to debate them, to assess its consequences, to appreciate the impact they might have in our own societies. There should be little doubt that in the present condition of its economy, the Latin American region should look both at the difficulties of its own regional integration and to the macro-regional agreements like the TPP and the TTIP, which are in the making and aim to overcome the paralysis of the Doha round. I cannot obviously get into these questions at length. Let me make only two main points. The first refers to the national integration, to per, excuse me, the first refers to regional integration and the insertion of Latin American countries into the world system. We all seem to agree in our region that intra-regional trade is more diversified, concentrates on manufacturers, has a higher technological content, is more accessible to small and medium-sized enterprises and, created more, and creates more jobs in comparison to other regions. This is why, given the slow dynamism of our exports, especially in the, South Amer in the Southern American region, and, their increase on the and the increase on the concentration in primary goods as a result of the Chinese boom, we should be giving an uppermost priority to the regional integration, to regional integration. Yet the process continues to be extremely low. The bright spot from our point of view is the Alliance for the Pacific, of the Pacific, an approach to which Chile, along with Peru, Colombia and Mexico are fully committed. In the Alliance of the Pacific, we want to build in a participatory and consensual manner, an area of deep economic integration and to move gradually towards free circulation of goods, services, capitals and persons. 
we want to become a platform for political articulation, economic and trade integration, and encourage this strength to the rest of the world with a special emphasis on the Asia-Pacific region. We see the Pacific Alliance as an open and non-exclusive integration process, and we have initiated a dialogue with Mercosur in order to coordinate policies which mean, in practical terms, to learn the principles of diversity, to live within a framework of different models, and look for possible convergences when we have to face the wide agenda of global challenges. One of these challenges, probably the main one, is the scenario opened by macro-regional agreements. Let me use just one example on the way in which these macro-regional agreements might impact Latin America. The discussions, or the result of the discussions between the United States and the European Union of, on subjects like trade of, genetic, of genetically modified products, on the use of hormones in the creation of livestock, or the regulation of biofuels, will have evident, obvious, and enormous consequences to many countries in the region that are exporters of these products. There is no place where Latin Americans discuss about these issues. It is obvious that we need to increase efforts to open a regional exchange on these matters. The space of dialogue between the Alliance of the Pacific and Mercosur could be one of them. It is well known that Chile, Peru and Mexico are negotiating along with the US the Trans-Pacific Partnership with seven other Asian countries. Chile is fully committed to its success. Yet let me make a general comment on our approach and the difficulties we still have in the negotiation. This is a bit of a commercial advertisement. As a distinguished Chilean economist recently wrote, if done right, the TPP could help Mexico, Peru and Chile make a leap to high productivity exports based on innovation. But that would require the TPP to foster, not to impede, the flow of knowledge around the Pacific Rim. Some insistence in a series of restrictive intellectual property provisions do little to create a sound environment for innovation elsewhere, that means in our countries. This issue has become, in fact, almost the sole obstacle in the process of negotiation. We understand the value of new and higher standard rules, and we see the TPP as harmonizing and standardizing the rules contained in numerous trade agreements in force among TPP countries boosting trade in the region and taking advantage of the global value chains. However, in order to succeed in this negotiation, the TPP rules shall contain a careful balance among the different interests and domestic constraints of the members, as well as their own domestic policy goals. A second point on this same uh, perspective of the present Latin American development refers to the relations between Latin America and China. The recent visit of Prime Minister Li Keqiang to Brazil, Colombia, Peru and Chile, four countries that represent 57% of the regional trade with that country, is of enormous importance. While CEPAL has underlined the Economic Commission for Latin America that this relationship contributes to a pattern that is far from the needs to diversify exports in the area. In fact, it has conducted to a concentration on primary goods. One cannot but consider China's presence in the region as a main economic and political factor. It is important to underline that this visit was oriented not to boosting trade, but to promote Chinese investments in the region, which continues to be of a small amount. Official FDA, FDA, FDI from Asia to the region is minimal, accounting for some 6% of total flows in 2014, of which one-sixth comes from China. However, a contrast between the TPP as an American offer to the region and the Chinese promotion of investments in infrastructure, industrial development, and financial matters, as a Chinese offer to the region, would be a fascinating subject to explore. Suffice to say here that the concreteness of one offer 
and the abstract rulemaking type of the other might induce some to take the wrong conclusion that Latin America has to opt. In fact, we consider our association with China as an important policy objective, and we don't see any contradiction of that association with what cons we consider the, the, the most important trade agreement of the 21st century, I refer to the TPP. Let me say finally some words on the relationship between the region and the United States. From our perspective, Chilean perspective, the support of the United States in the peace negotiations in Colombia, the United States government positions on immigration, and especially the restoration of diplomatic relations with Cuba has generated a new and different stage in hemispheric relations. We see this as a historical turn point. This scenario opens the way for associate, associated initiatives in the hemisphere in all those areas where cooperation favors the solution of hemispheric problems, the defense of democracy and the defense of human rights. For Chile, an important point is cooperation in matters of environment and global warming. The next meeting of the oceans in Valparaíso initially promoted by Washington and led today by our country, will examine the protection of species in the Pacific Ocean and the declaration of protected areas to prevent maritime piracy. This is an example of cooperation that didn't exist before. But in Central America, the possibilities of several countries in South America to promote the establishment of democratic institutions and contribute to improving the transparency of state of states and the overall economic system in those countries opens an important opportunity for hemispheric cooperation and is also an important complement to the initiatives that the United States has adopted in Honduras, Guatemala and El Salvador. I believe after being one year here in Washington that the possibility of cooperation between my country and some of the Southern American countries with the United States in Central America is an extremely important political element, uh, cooperation element, that would strengthen enormously the possibilities for cooperation in other difficult areas in the hemisphere. There are conditions today, therefore, for a more deliberate cooperation between our countries in the hemisphere. But as I said at the beginning, a good foreign policy needs healthy state institutions. It needs democratic institutions, and it needs institutions free of corruption, in which transparency has been transformed into a principle, an institutional principle. This is why I believe the composition of topics in the discussion that is going to happen today is so valuable. I hope to have contributed to these reflections. Thank you very much. Missing one. Está el guardo? Hello? We are missing one. Eduardo was sitting right there. That's it. We have confirmed the October. Caramba. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, especially Cynthia, for inviting me to be the moderator of this first panel on combating corruption and building the rule of law in Latin America. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Excellent speech. Uh, the only problem is that now you cut off 15 minutes of our panel, mm -hmm. but we will try to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for that contribution. Uh, and thank you very <laughs> much <laughs> to all of you for, I'm, I'm in a very difficult situation here managing four Latin American plus one five, and I don't want to give the impression that we are not able to manage time properly like Germans. So uh, <laughs> now that my president, Cristina Fernandez Kirchner, said that Argentina has less poverty than Germany. So uh, <laughs> it's a good moment to compare with, with Germany. <laughs> this is official. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Uh, my name is Daniel Sobato. I'm the regional director of International IDEA for Latin America and the Caribbean of, and also a member of the advisory board for the Latin American program here at the Wilder Wilson Center. And today we are privileged to have uh, four distinguished panelists, Alejandro Ponce, Paulo Sotero, Eduardo Bojorquez, and Carlos Fernando Chamorro, to discuss a topic, as the ambassador has said recently, that is of great importance within the region the need to strengthen the rule of law to combat corruption. I want to give a special thanks to our four panelists for their participation in this event and also for the time that they have invested uh, during the preparation. And let me briefly introduce them to all of you. First of all, Alejandro Ponce, who is the chief researcher officer of the World Justice Project and one of the original designers of the rule of law index. He has worked as a researcher at Yale University and as an economist at the World Bank. He holds a BA in economics from ITAM in Mexico and a master and a PhD in economics from Stanford University. Alejandro will speak about the current situation of the rule of law in Latin America using data from the rule of law index recently presented here in DC for the 2015 report. After that, Paulo Sotero, is the director of the Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center and a professor at George Washington University, Elliott School of International Affairs. A journalist from Sao Paulo, was a foreign correspondent for most of his career in Paris and Lisbon for Veja Weekly Magazine from 1972 to 1977 and in Washington for Daily's Estado de Sao Paulo from 1989 to 2006. Paulo under the title of Is Brazil at the Beginning of the End of a Culture of Impunity? will analyze the current situation of the rule of law and the fight against corruption that is taking place in Brazil. Eduardo Bojorquez is the Executive Director of Transparencia Mexicana, the Mexican chapter of Transparencia Internacional, and board member of the National Council on Open Data and the Accountability Network. He has been responsible for pushing for the creation of the new national anti-corruption system in his country. Eduardo, under the title New Legislation in Transparency, Access to Information and Anti-Corruption, is Mexico moving away from the logic of anti-corruption SARS, will explore the current situation in Mexico, as well the potential impact of this new legislation in fighting corruption. And finally, Carlos Fernando Chamorro, who is a Nicaraguan journalist. He's a director of Esta Semana, a TV magazine, and WWW Confidential. Carlos was a Knight Fellow at Stanford University, 1997-1998, and he received the Maria Moore's Cabot Prize from Columbia University in 2010. Carlos Fernando, under the title Zero Transparency in Nicaragua, Venezuela, Petrodollars, and the Interoceanic Channel, Channel sorry, will analyze the situation in Nicaragua as a case study on how the dismantling of the rule of law by an authoritarian regime generates a dynamic that fosters corruption and impunity. Our discussion today will follow the basic, this basic format. A six minutes introduction will be given by each panelist to discuss their respective topics. This will be followed by a series of questions that I will make 
to our panelists, which will give them a chance to develop the introductory analysis even further. After that, we will receive questions from the audience. And then in the last part, we will go to the conclusion of these panels. I will give each of our participants a chance to provide closing remarks. Without further uh, saying, um, I would like to start with Alejandro. Alejandro, you have your six minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to this panel, uh, to a very interesting panel. Uh, let me just start with um, a story that happened uh, three weeks ago. I was in Mexico City with my family, with my son and my wife, uh, trying to come up with activities for my toddler. Uh, and uh, just I talked to my sister about the possibility of actually going to a lake that I went a couple of times with my parents. And uh, she said, no way, the, the lake is polluted, it's extremely polluted. So I actually checked on the internet and the pictures that I saw were actually not very satisfying. When I actually started reading about it, it turned out that many of the companies had been polluting. And essentially, even though in the legislation and in the regulation they shouldn't pollute, the authorities were actually not enforcing it. So the point here is just because of the lack of regulatory enforcement, because of their lack of rule of law, um, just the lake is polluted. Uh, I couldn't take my child to the, to the lake. But more importantly, the communities that are there can actually uh, are suffering. Um, so the point here is that the rule of law actually matters for our daily lives. So the rule of law is not simply something that uh, just when we talk about legislation or when we talk about the incentives, it's something that actually matters to us in our very, very um, everyday life. When it matters when we just uh, take our children to school, when we are the victims of a crime, when we just uh, simply the regulation is not enforced and we actually have uh, polluted rivers, when we actually have, do not have access to justice, uh, when funds are embezzled and we cannot actually just get pavement or, or just our streets paved and so on. So, so the point here is that it matters for all citizens in the street. This is an issue that goes beyond just simply talking about rhetoric of the rule of law. It matters for all of us. So just all the different elements that I have been talking about touch somehow uh, the rule of law. So essentially what we need is a framework to understand what can we, uh, if we want to improve the rule of law, we need to understand what it means. Somehow we have an idea of what it means but probably it's useful to have an a, a analytical framework. Uh, essentially, just the, this framework really is about, a, a, we can summarize it as a governance principle, essentially, in which everyone is accountable to the law. And we can put some structures on the, on the law, uh, and we can add many things, just like the, the United Nations does on the, the actual process of, of the creation of the laws, the enforcement, and so on. Uh, but essentially, it has a, basic elements which pertain to the relationship between the state and the society. So on one hand, we can think very broadly about constraints that the society impose on the power of the state, such as institutional constraints, legislators, judiciaries, but also constraints on uh, just to avoid that uh, politicians embezzle funds or appropriate corrupt funds, or that the government is actually open and participate and provide access to information on that the government actually respects fundamental rights. At the same time, the rule of law imposes some duties on the state. Every state in the world has certain duties. So they have actually, in every state in the world, they have to provide security to its citizens. They have to provide justice or mediums to redress grievances and solve disputes. They have to enforce regulation. So all these elements so it, uh, provide a framework to understand the rule of law. Um, just uh, very briefly, uh, just what I will mention is just the, some uh, statistics or some uh, analysis based on an exercise that we did in which we basically interviewed 100,000 people in 100 countries in the world to try to capture many of these, or many of these issues. Uh, in Latin America, obviously Latin America has been uh, through a process of democratization and, and possess very interesting features, growth, it's, uh, a lot of stability recently, a lot of institutional changes that, um, that, that have happened over the last few years. But obviously the rule of law is still uh, an issue that we know that uh, is, is still a, a, an ideal that we want to, to attain. Uh, just three, three elements from the data. The first one is that when we talk about Latin America as a whole, Latin America is extremely diverse. We have countries such as Chile or Uruguay that in our index actually rank just very close to some of the European countries, even so some, some recent scandals. And uh, we have also countries such as Honduras or Venezuela 
which rank at the very bottom. And the circumstances in the two countries is extremely different. However, there are some commonalities as well. Uh, I'm just let me mention three that I can just probably go, go deeper afterwards. So one is uh, fundamental freedoms and openness. So something that we see, we don't see dictatorships anymore in Latin America. We don't see the regimes that we see in Middle East or in Central Asia. So in general, in Latin American societies, societies are very open. Uh, just, uh, just people can actually express their views. 70% of the people say that they can actually express their views in Latin America higher than in any <coughs> other region in the world. Uh, most countries have joined the Open Government Partnership and have legislation to actually promote access to information and so on. So that's, that's an environment that, that fosters the promotion of the rule of law. Uh, second, probably the main uh, challenges are on one hand security, which is at the top of the concerns of all citizens or most citizens in Latin America, and that is accompanied obviously by the performance of the criminal justice system, uh, uh, the police and so on, and the struggles that the police still have in all Latin American countries, even countries that are at the top, they still struggle with crime, just not necessarily related to drug trafficking, but daily crime in the streets of the cities. The third one is obviously a, a accountability and a just corruption and so on that pertains actually of the nature of Latin American societies on the, what we uh, were discussing before, the client patrons network that still exists in Latin America and that pertain to, to uh, corruption and so on. So with that, let me just, just stop because it's, it's time. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Paulo, uh, your six minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. A pleasure to be here talking to you. I would like to give you a bit of an example of what the rule of law entails, actually, because uh, in Brazil, uh, I think uh, we are in a struggle right now about the rule of law. Uh, Thirty-four years ago, I was a correspondent already here. I met a historian dear friend, now Boris Fausto. He was a fellow at the Wilson Center. We were talking about the democracy in Brazil. We knew it was coming. We had been fighting for it, and Boris warned me, saying, Paulo, reestablishing elections and the mechanisms of democracy will be the easiest part. The most difficult part will be to impose the rule of law in Brazil, a very unjust nation that has a story of oppression, and to <coughs> make people in positions of influence be accountable for their misdeeds. Well, uh, 34 years after we had that conversation, there is where we are. We are at that moment in Brazil. Uh, over the past five years, three important episodes that I would like to report to you. First, uh, a law was approved in Brazil, in the Brazilian Congress. It was a bill proposed by popular action. You can do that in Brazil if you have the necessary number of signatures. A law was proposed to uh, prohibit corrupt politicians that have been found guilty in a court from running, believe it or not, they could run before this law, even if they were having troubles with the law. This was approved, and this, uh, we call it the clean record law, and this started a process manifesting the desire of society in Brazil to confront this problem. Then we had, in uh, 2012, the trial of what we believe then was the largest case of political corruption in Brazil, was a vote-buying scheme in Congress that involved some 55 people. This went on for about seven years. The denunciation, the relations were made in 2005. Uh, in 2012, a uh, number of people tried. Uh, of the 50 or so indicted, 25 were found guilty, 12 was, were sentenced to jail, to serve jail terms. This was very important. It happened on national television because most of the proceedings happened at the Supreme Court in Brazil, and Supreme Court proceedings in Brazil are nationally televised. The country was glued to television for a number of weeks. At the end, 
uh, 12 people of people that occupied positions of influence in Brazil were sent to jail and served sentences of at least one year uh, and are now serving uh, the remainder of the sentence in house arrest for various different regimes. Among those were the chief of staff of the most popular president of Brazil, <coughs> the president of the Workers' Party, which is the party of President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva and President Dilma Rousseff, uh, the treasurer of that party, the speaker of the house. Uh, there were obviously reactions to that saying that was all politically motivated. Uh, you could make that case. The problem is that the majority of the judges of the Supreme Court that ruled the way they ruled and sent people to jail were nominated to the Supreme Court by Presidents Lula and Dilma Rousseff. Uh, in March, le March last year, thanks to the actions of Brazilian federal prosecutors, Brazilian federal policemen, Brazilian federal judges, a case was started regarding uh, accusations of wrongdoing in Petrobras largest state company in Brazil, the largest company in Brazil. Uh, since then, 110 people have been implicated and are now under criminal investigation, including more than 50 members of the Brazilian Congress, among those the current Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate. Uh, the, some sentences have been already returned. These cases will, will go on, but both cases reflect something that is new in Brazil. Is that, uh, oh, uh, business executives of some of the most powerful companies in Brazil that we believed were absolutely untouchable are, have been detained. Are with, some of them are still responding to, uh, to the process under detention and the case will continue. This episode revealed something that we always knew in Brazil was a radio, uh, a, an X-ray of corruption. The cases will continue and uh, the reason we have that, and I will uh, talk more about this, this in the next round, is not because a federal judge or a prosecutor or a policeman decided so. This is the result of institutional changes in Brazil. This is a country where the, mo the rule of law is gaining ground. Thank you very much, Paulo. Eduardo. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Duncan. Let me start with a, a paradox, another paradox in Latin America, uh, one that is associated with uh, major concepts that have been used in this table. One is transparency, the other one is anti-corruption. And let me provide you a concrete example of of this paradox. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is not just for the Mexican case, but I'm going to refer to the Mexican case. Mexico City ranks number one in the country in terms of access to information. It's fully transparent in terms of our own metrics. But it ranks position 32 out of 32 states in the country in terms of corruption. And this is relevant for this table and for the future discussions about transparency, accountability, anti-corruption, and rule of law because we, we tend to put all these concepts in, within the same basket. And when you, we, we are trying to say that someone is transparent, probably we are trying to refer to someone that is honest. And when we are trying to talk about uh, um, opaque, we are talking about someone that is not only dishonest, but corrupt, and sometimes uh, something worse than that. So we, we have to start thinking more carefully about how these concepts connect among each other and what they really mean. Mexico has been leading anti-transparency uh, efforts for more than a decade. We had one of the most prominent laws in the world in 2002 and 2003. We have been reforming this law so many times now. This is the fourth constitutional reform to the, our access to information law. And you can say we have a lot of information. Mexico is not right now chairing the Open Government Partnership. And I'm pretty sure, as, as you've, you've heard from, from this mini bio, 
that, you know, open data is right now a top priority for President Peña. There is a national independent council on open data. We're part of the OGP. Too many initiatives, but still these this kind of reforms are not paying. Probably that was the, the reason why in December 2013, with the within something called the Mexico's Pact, a political pact among the elites and the political parties to pass a group of reforms. When Senate approved by, uh, by unanimity one law in anti-corruption, creating a new huge SAR, no, a new independent autonomous commission, nobody clapped one single time outside the Senate House. It was approved with the, with the political support of every single political party in the country, but nothing happened, forget about impunity, think about political popularity after passing what, this kind of legislation. Nothing happened and what really was the, the consequence of this, this political movement was that a lot of the, the members of our community in civil society, some academics and many other people started thinking about how all these policies were fragmented among each other, how we were passing patches to the legislation. We were transforming one institution at a, at a, at a time and they, they gained the political leverage for transforming one and then the next one. And Congress was producing a lot of stuff that made no sense among it. Uh, so the, the, the logic of civil society and some of the accountability network and some other colleagues was to try to move from SARS, from the logic that you can concentrate power in one single entity and that this power is going to be enough for solving a problem in a federation like Mexico or Brazil that has the complexities of the sovereignty of each one of the states and municipal authorities. So the, the logic that one single person was good enough for solving a society's a national problem. I, the national anti-corruption system, as it is called now and uh, has already passed constitutional reform, is thinking probably the way that we, we have been listening today, including the ambassador presentation on institutions. No? Rather than appointing a SAR, let's start creating the institutions that we require in many, many fields. I'm not going to refer because of the time constraints to the rule of law, law side. I'm just going to focus on the institutions we're reforming within the anti-corruption uh, domain. 14 articles of the Constitution in Mexico were touched by this reform. Even for Mexico's standards, this is a lot. No? This is referring not, not only to anti-corruption within the administrative law, but also the, the, the criminal side of it. And we broke a monopoly of what was called the anti-corruption SAR, which in practice was just the internal controller of the government, but we, we, we used to call him the SAR, the anti-corruption SAR. So we broke a monopoly and now Congress and the executive branch both are capable of conducting administrative uh, investigation related to corruption. We broke another very traditional item in Mexico that we were talking about corruption for politicians but never for the private sector. So for the first time ever no, we are considering not, I mean in contrast with the US we, we still have a big breach there, but we are considering to prosecute the two parts of a corrupt scheme, the private sector and the public sector. And not with a fine but with the possibility of uh, actually closing down a company. Uh, now, these reforms are going to have a secondary effect, and, uh, which is also a very, very dramatic legislative process. We are considering that we are going to affect 18 different laws from procurement laws to those related to this, this system that has at least six new uh, institutions playing a role in anti-corruption. This is going to be absolutely anticlimactic. If you're expecting someone to be catched because the uh, approval of the anti-corruption system, then let's discuss the general attorney's independence and autonomy. But if you want to see better institutional performance, this is the path to go. Uh, forgetting about the logic of an anti-corruption SAR and entering the very boring area of implementation, of administrative reform, of minor changes that have macro effects like the scandals we've seen in, in the media for too long now. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Eduardo. And now, Carlos Fernando, about the case of Nicaragua. Thank you, Daniel. I offer you my apologies because I lost the clarity of my voice. I hope to keep <laughs> my ideas more or less clear. Uh, my premise is that Nicaragua could be analyzed as a case study on how 
the dismantling of the rule of the law generates a dynamic that fosters corruption and impunity. This process has taken place, place through more than a decade, started when President Arnoldo Alemán uh, made a deal with Daniel Ortega being the leader of the opposition, uh, but it has been uh, strengthened when Ortega came to power in the year 2007. The fact is that in Nicaragua today there is no single state power or state institution, whether it is Congress, the Electoral Council, the National Controller, or the su Supreme Court of Justice that will have some degree of autonomy to contest the executive and the rule of one person. And although the irony is that this situation of zero transparency and no rule of the law is uh, uh, coexisting with a flourishing uh, business opportunity, both for the people related with the government, but for the business class in general. It's something that has happened in the past in other countries, because we have this sort of uh, alliance between the government and big capital uh, in a corporativist scheme. I want to illustrate with two examples. One is the petrodollars, the relationship with Venezuela, and the other one is the Interoceanic Canal. Uh, Nicaragua has benefited since the year 2007 from a very generous treaty for oil cooperation with Venezuela under Petrocaribbean Alba. Basically, the deal says we have to pay in cash in 90 days 50% of the imports and the other 50% become a long-term credit for 25 years. But this credit has been uh, channelized through a private entity, a private cooperative, cooperative named Caruna, close to the president. And uh, to, uh, in the year 2010, Nicaragua informed the IMF that 62% of those funds will be destined to profit investment and 38% for subsidies and social programs. As a result, in eight, after eight years of Venezuelan cooperation, uh, there has been a diversion of uh, $3.4 billion from state cooperation to private business. It's a sort of an anomalous privatization, but under no law, under no public oversight or accountability. And uh, the, the, this fund is equivalent to at least one third of fiscal income. It's not, it's not small money. Uh, one percentage is devoted to social assistance program, but the other one is oriented towards business uh, development. Uh, a private company had been created after the marriage of two uh, state companies, PDVSA from Venezuela and Petronic. Uh, their daughter is called Albaniza, and Albaniza is today responsible for the, for the production of 25% of Nicaraguan energy, is the second largest exporter, and, and there's, a, there's a network of companies around Albaniza that include the purchase of TV networks, a chain of gas stations, hotel, agribusiness, banks, different operations that have nothing to do with combating poverty or building social or uh, economic infrastructure. So in a normal country, with the rule of the law, at least Congress or the National Controller will be doing some kind of investigation about this connection, but in Nicaragua only uh, a few independent media outlets are doing this. Now, regarding the canal, I think it is worse in terms of transparency. The law was approved two years ago by the, by the FSLN congressman in, uh, uh, after a no-bidding process, a Chinese, a mysterious Chinese bus businessman named Wang Jin was chosen to build this uh, 50 billion uh, project. Uh, and uh, the most important law in Nicaraguan history was approved in a process that took seven days, including two days for consultation and three hours of debate in the assembly floor. This law renders irrestrict rights to the concession holder in detriment to the, to the country and national laws creating some kind of a private protectorate within the country for 50 years, extensible to another 50 years. There are high expectations among the Nicaraguan population and the business class 
uh, because of the so-called benefits that will come after the canal. But there are three main concerns that are shared by most of the people. One is the undermining of the right of property, property private property. Over 23,000 families, 120,000 citizens, will be directly affected or relocated from the canal route that has provoked uh, demonstrations by peasants. Number two is the environmental impact because the canal will require dredging at least 105 kilometers in the Nicaraguan lake, which is the most important reservoir for water in the country. Uh, and number three, which is probably much more complex, is the speculation with the sub-projects. The canal law is some kind of an umbrella where it includes not only the canal, but 10 other projects. It includes uh, free trade zones, touristic projects, oil pipe pipelines, trains, uh, deep water ports, airports, etc. What happens if the canal is not built, which is probably going to happen because there is no uh, evidence of where the money is or what is the viability in terms of commercial terms or environmental terms? Well, Nicaragua will be attached to this law for 50 years or more under this speculative uh, network of different projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos Fernando. I want to thank the four para panelists, vos, not claro. only for the mm -hmm. no great vos. intervention, but also for adjusting to the time. Uh, this was a panel about rule of law, and mm. of course, enforcement is very critical. <laughs> um, <coughs> Alejandro, you said that one of the three areas that uh, is getting out of the index, the rule of law index, is that we are not doing so good in terms of accountability. And then if we link this with a comment uh, coming from Eduardo that's saying you can be very transparent but not necessarily not corrupt, why openness has not translated into more accountability and less corruption in, in Latin America? What is, what is your assessment? Uh, thank you. Now, this, this is, uh, I, I completely agree with, with what uh, Eduardo was saying because we observe the same kind of pattern when we uh, look at uh, the cross section of countries. We see uh, in many other countries, uh, not only Mexico, but in, in other countries in Latin America, that uh, uh, the freedoms in general, freedom of association, freedom of speech, <coughs> are well respected, the freedom of NGOs to actually engage are very well respected. And when we actually look even not only at the laws, because many countries actually ver have very good laws uh, on access to information, but even at the, the actual performance of countries in these issues, in reality, just we, we observe uh, just high adherence to these laws. In some cases, it's not possible to get sensible information, but in most cases, just as pertains to the citizen, they obtain the information. What happens then? So why is it that if citizens can actually monitor the state just through this access to information laws, they cannot uh, hold the government officials accountable? And there are certain missing links here. I think that when, when the movement of freedom of information started, it was assumed that accountability was going to come afterwards. But it's not necessarily the case. So usually the story what happens is that we find about <coughs> a, 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 a corrupt politician, it's in the media, the newspapers actually report about it, and then nothing <coughs> happens. So then just, and, and this is even in a case of, of uh, uh, someone who is known. We don't know about the, the multiple cases that happens in, in the entire system, all the systemic corruption that happens in countries in which if I want to get a, a, a contract, I actually ask for a bribe or part of the contract or just the contract is, is given to my friend and so on. <laughs> all these situations are not known and are completely unrelated or difficult to actually evaluate just in the context of, of freedom of information. Something, the, the link I think that is missing is, is what we have been talking about, the strengthening the rest of the institutions. And it's not necessarily, it's national institutions, local institutions, the judicial system that we haven't talked about plays a very important role to actually enforce all these things. So, so the key is that people actually working in these institutions have actually the incentives to monitor what's happening, to actually uh, whistleblow if something happens. A strong leaders are actually committed to combating corruption rather than just simply having someone who is going to prosecute their enemies. So all these things that happen at the more uh, granular level, 
that actually is about the strength of institution, that actually is, is not newsworthy, but, but perhaps actually is, is more powerful. Just a final point, I think th that this assumption, even though that we have been talking about uh, openness, we have to recognize that many countries still in Latin America actually just regressing in that regard. We have some issues in Venezuela where actually NGOs have been, pro have been uh, attacked or in, in Bolivia, uh, in Ecuador as well somehow. So, so this is even though just this, this climate of, of openness, just we have still some states in Latin America which are slightly more autocratic, which actually have been, have been attacking some of these and which is this, this process is even at the step before the process that I was just, just talking about. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Pablo, um, I, I, I have two questions. Um, number one is, what is your assessment in terms of uh, how a dysfunctional political system, together with a quiet and popular Congress, reacts in the face of growing so uh, societal expectation of accountability? But also, a lot uh, we have heard in the last two or three weeks, what are the domestic implications in Brazil of the ongoing FIFA corruption scandal? Well, on the first question, obviously, I think Congress politicians in Brazil react to the new attitude of uh, the population vis-a-vis -vis corruption, which is one the expectation that corrupt people will be prosecuted. The, the expectation in Brazil has changed. We, we, we saw before that corruption was invented in Brazil, but would be ever be in Brazil. No, it has changed completely. People now, now are more mobilized, more informed. So I think uh, uh, the impact in Congress is one, first and foremost, one of fear. Because fear, because there are 55 people now under criminal investigations by a generation of young prosecutors that are uh, very well regarded in Brazil. Uh, they are very well trained. Actually, the team of uh, the prosecutors dealing with the Petrobras case, which involves the direct uh, uh, theft of $2 billion from a company, uh, are all trained here in the United States. They are very good at what they do. So uh, politicians are on notice in Brazil, and there is no way of ignoring the pressure. Uh, and there is no way, the, the genie is out of the lamp. It's not going to be put back there. So it's up to, you know, keep this pressure and this young generation of prosecutors and young generation of judges are uh, courageous and are, they are doing their job because they know, they feel the pressure. On the FIFA business, I think it couldn't be, uh, it's very well timed as far as Brazil is concerned. <laughs> because as you know, our love for soccer, uh, <laughs> although we are a bit, you know, uh, sort of after something that happened last year, mm -hmm. but we fully recognize German is the best team. Uh, <laughs> this has Touché. revealed something that we already knew, that soccer has been used, the power of the soccer federations and the money involved in soccer has been, uh, you know, used to commit crimes and that these people were all also untouchable. The gentleman that, the Brazilian gentleman, former head of the Soccer Federation, arrested in Zurich the other day, Marin, uh, was a former governor of Sao Paulo, a gov former vice governor and then governor of Sao Paulo. He was a vice government of another government that cannot now leave Brazil because there is an Interpol uh, notice about him. So uh, it brings you know, uh, it, I think it helps mobilize. There is one wonderful politician in Brazil, a senator from Rio. You may uh, identify the name. His name is Romário. He was, he's a World, World Cup champion. He, 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 he helped Brazil won the fourth a championship in, in Los Angeles in 94. Uh, 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 Romário has been, and other politicians, younger politicians, have been at the forefront of this denunciation. And I think this uh, case just makes prosecuting crime even more popular. So I think that I, I believe the Secretary of Justice of the United States and the FBI are pretty popular these days in Brazil. Thank you very much, Paulo. Um, it's good for us that we lost 
in the final with Germany, <coughs> maybe that was a corruption there that we can tell <coughs> in the final result. That goal was one of the most beautiful <laughs> scored by the German, one of the most beautiful ever. Okay, the 7 1 is, is well taken then. Um, Mexico. Paulo said about fear, fear in Brazil that now things are going to be tough and that if you did something wrong and you are, uh, you have to go to jail. Is that feeling of fear also the same in Mexico? I think uh, the social expectation about uh, putting people in jail is always present. I, I do remember a very long conversation with uh, former President Fox on these issues, no? the, the big, uh, big fish frying theory. No? And uh, after a while, he was incapable of frying anything, no? <laughs> not, 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 not even fishes. Um, I have, you know, I totally agree with Pablo and uh, with Alejandro that we, we still require an independent judiciary that can prosecute cases. Mm -hmm. But if you focus too much on this issue, you're forgetting about the anticlimactic side of institutional reform. Let me provide you when, with one single example from Latin America. A very good friend of mine, Jose Ugas, prosecuted 1,100 people in, in, Peru. in Peru, including the, a very powerful man, mm. Vladimiro Montesinos, mm. and this opened the door to the prosecution mm. of President Fujimori. Mm. After that fantastic, uh, epic effort, who was reelected? Uh, you know, after a couple of years, a politician that was accused of corruption just before he left office, Alan Garcia. And if you see the, the connection between the democratic uh, condition in Mexico or in any other countries and corruption, it's, it's quite strong. I mean, there is a, a wonderful article by Luis Carlos Ugalde about the connection about democratic uh, political institutions in Mexico and how this made corruption being more or present in, in the connection with the private sector. So, of course, we need to strengthen the judiciary. Of course, we need independence for it. Of course, we, we need major important cases. But a lot of the, of the job has to be done in the preventive side of it, in terms of better procurement laws, a better relationship between the private sector and the public sector, protocols to sit to the table when you're talking <coughs> with a company, stuff that is not really sexy, no? but it's also very important to, to take into the equation. Let me, let me go one step further, uh, Eduardo. If we see what's happening right now in Chile, uh, there were some scandals of corruption. Conflict of interest. A scandal of corruption with SQM and Penta. That was not conflict of interest. Yes. That was big scandal. Yes. Private companies giving money with boletas that they were fake, uh, getting out of uh, paying taxes, and people faking that they were giving uh, advisory services where that was not true. The conflict of interest was much more close to, 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 to President Bachelet. However, strong leadership from President Bachelet, she took care of the situation, she created a commission, uh, proposed a recommendation, went to the parliament. Recently, she appointed a minister to lead this process. There was a conflict of interest of that minister. In 72 hours, the minister resigned. People are in jail from private business yeah. because that's another important aspect. We always tend have the, the temptation to put a lot of emphasis on the politicians and not on the private. I think that now we are looking for two hands. The one that is giving the money, the one is receiving the money, and the conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Now, if you see Brazil, people have been sent to jail, high-level people. Yeah. The president of the PT, the number one more close uh, uh, advisor to, to President uh, Lula, and so forth the current president of the, uh, of the deputy, the current president of the Senate, uh, are not in jail, but are indicted. Let me ask this question, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot. No, no, no. Do you see the same situation in Mexico in spite of all this reform, the new legislation, corruption, where the president is completely outside of that? Uh, are, is Mexico following more or less the trend that we are seeing in other parts, or is having a middle ground? First, let me, let me be very clear with one issue. Constitutional reform just passed. Uh, this is a very recent uh, reform. Now, let me provide you with a very long list of examples. No, I'm joking that I'm going to be law abider. Um, mm -hmm. Oceanographia case. The guy was, the, the chairman is in prison. He, well, he, he was, he's under prosecution. 
and the people responsible in Pemex was fined and they, they, they had consequences, they were sanctioned. But it's not enough. The day the guy, Janez, was, was detained by the police, nothing was happening in public mm -hmm. opinion in terms of saying, wow, this is, this is too heavy. The leader of the teachers union is in jail, no? Because of corruption. And that was not enough. I mean, you can make a list of a lot. The um, uh, federal uh, consumer protection uh, attorney general, no? He's, he, he left office. The head of the National Waters Commission, he left office because of corruption and scandal. So, I mean, it's never enough. That's, that's the point I want to make. It's important to keep in mind that you require independent professional prosecutors. You require a, a, a very professional attorney general. You need people in jail, but public opinion, I, it's, this is very difficult to say, is never satisfied by the fact that you are prosecuting people. Uh, that's, that's the reason why you have to invest in uh, what Alejandro is pointing out uh, is the basis of the index of rule of law. A lot of institutional reform and changes. Mm -hmm. And for countries like Mexico that are federations, and I, I'm pretty sure Paulo may, may share these views, you can not only operate at the federal level or at the level of Pemex or Petrobras, no? You have 32 states governed by guys that are fully autonomous and that also play a lot of, of uh, dirty games in this issue. That's the reason why in the, in the new legislation on anti-corruption, <coughs> one of the most sensitive areas, Daniel, and this was really, m probably the public opinion was discussing the president's uh, role in this issue, but you know, for the, for the technical discussion, the most difficult part was the possibility of the Supreme Audit Institution that is dependent on Congress to audit 92% uh, percent, uh, of the resources of the state level governments that are capped by the federal government and sent to the states for, the, for public expenditure. That was the most sensitive issue in practical terms in Congress. I mean, of course, there was a political discussion about how the president was going to be prosecuted or not, or if he had legal protection for doing so. But in practical terms, I can tell you because I saw the legislatures, you know, fighting really hard on this issue. They didn't want the Supreme Audit Institution of Mexico to audit resources of the state and local authorities. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, Carlos, uh, two things. Um, you said Nicaragua is a case study for country where the rule of law is not working. Actually, you, your title was zero <laughs> transparency, <laughs> to be completely clear. Uh, but I remember years ago how much money the international community invested in Nicaragua to really create the institutions. Where, what, what happened there, number one? And number two, I'm really amazed about the private sector position in Nicaragua. Um, I remember when I worked in Nicaragua in 1990 election, um, private sector was very, very opposite to President Daniel Ortega. Now that Daniel Ortega is being several times as president, what happened? Is, is this uh, coming back to Somoza? Uh, you guys take care and do good business and make money, and I will do the business and the politics? Are we going back to Somoza years in, in Nicaragua with the support now of the private sector? Yeah, I, I'll start with the second part of the question. I think there is some kind of a deja vu about the Somoza period, and you describe it more or less in the way in which it's happening. Uh, one of the reasons why Somoza went into crisis was corruption, repression, but also what was called during those days a loyal competition, because he went into areas of business with the and conflicting with the private sector. So when I talk to the private sector these days as a reporter, well, I always talk with them off the record. They never go in public, and I try to push them to do it. Well, some people said, well, there's a lot of corruption, but I will never say that in public because Ortega will close my bank. Another guy said to me, we are going like in a, in a uh, high speed train, great opportunities to do a lot of business. We know there is a wall at the end of the tunnel. I know we, know, we don't know if the wall will be there in eight days, in two years or in five years. But as long as we have these opportunities, have to take advantage of this because I cannot oppose the government because no business group can survive government pressure. 
In general, I think there is a short-term view of, okay, this is the moment we have to take opportunities. The government is responsive to business claims. There is a fluid dialogue, not only through the, let's say, organized groups of the private sector, but in the one-to-one -one relationship with the big guys of the private sector. Uh, and, and, the, and the system is working. It's what they call la alianza del capital y el gobierno, or the corporative state. The private sector claims that at least 85 laws have been approved in Congress through consensus. Okay, that means that Congress doesn't work. There is a negotiation of four people from each group. They yeah. spend maybe six months debating the tax laws, and the tax law goes to Congress to be approved the way in which they decided. And the private sector excuses themselves saying, well, we don't trust politicians. Politicians, they have, they have, they don't do a bad job, and therefore, we want our interest to be represented. Okay, but who interest? The interest of very small group, not the interest of the general public. There is a problem ab about that. Uh, about what happened with the uh, process of uh, institution building in Nicaragua, I think the short answer is that the failure is the failure of politics. If the favor of politics, politicians, political parties, and civil societies. The laws were fine. There was a lot of money to have modern laws in the Supreme Court of Justice, in the Comptroller, etc. But there was not a capacity to build a political majority that will sustain those laws. No, I'm not talking about electoral majorities. We had electoral majorities in different moments in Nicaragua, but not a majority that will sustain those institutions in a moment of counter-reform. So we have in the year 2010, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, in, in, uh, in, the, in the year 2000, Ortega and Alemán, they made the pacto, they changed the constitutions, all institutions be became under the control of the parties. Then there was a moment of hope when Bolaños put Alemán in jail Alemán was sentenced for 20 years in jail because of corruption, money laundering, but Alemán lost political support, uh, Bolaños lost political support and had to rely on Ortega that had a lot of control in the Supreme Court of Justice and turn Alemán into his hostage. Then Alemán, Ortega came to power in the year 2007 and he strengthened this process of control of the institution. The final word was that uh, in the year 2009 and 10, the judges loyal to Aleman absolved him of all charges of corruption, while the, while the judges loyal to Ortega allowed his Ill re illegal re-election for the next year. But the, the worst thing I would say uh, is, is related with two, thing, two elements. One, the fall of the, uh, the credibility in the electoral systems. We have had fraud in different electoral processes. And number two, the regression in the process of institutionalization of the army and the police. Those two cases were the only one that we could say successful in the Nicaraguan transition, and that is completely lost now. Thank you very much, Carlos Fernando. So two, two, two strong people, now only one strong people, two yes. very weak institutions. Summing up. Good. Let's open the, the floor now for questions from the audience. Uh, Please identify yourself, ask for a micro, and shoot your questions. No questions. Okay. <laughs> One question. That's it. If after <coughs> your excellent presentation, analyzing all these issues, you don't have questions, I did a very, very bad job. So uh, please ask your questions. Go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Ryan Peck. My question is to specifically uh, Carlos F. Schumpemoro. I want to ask, there seems to be a perception that um, Nicaragua is growing and that progress is going on, or at least that was mentioned in the, it's an event at the uh, Inter-American Dialogue this morning. Uh, is there a perception in the Nicaraguan population that the country is growing because the executive branch has so much power? And if so, is there any measure that the international community could take to reverse this, if it is true? Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, 
I'm Will Pomeranz, Deputy Director of the Kennan Institute. I'm, I'm always, to begin with, I'm always impressed when people want the rule of law and they decide to point a czar, because I study Russia and the Russian Federation, and <laughs> usually czars are not necessarily compatible with rule of law. But my question, I guess, for the panel uh, as a whole is um, the, the role of kind of foreign legislation on anti-corruption domestically. So the United States has the FCPA, there are various anti-bribery legislation in Europe and so forth. Does that have any impact on the development of anti-corruption legislation inside these countries? Or does that seem something that is just uh, a kind of extra-jurisdictional uh, approach to rule of law? Yes. Any other question? Yes, please. You in the middle. Good afternoon, my name is Laura Natera, and my question is directly to uh, Alejandro Ponce, Mr. Alejandro Ponce. Um, we were discussing this afternoon of the importance of the rule of law, and you mentioned that some countries in Latin America are going backwards in terms of rule of law. One example is Venezuela. So my question to you is, uh, given the fact that without rule of law, a country cannot develop economically or <coughs> in any terms, uh, which do you think which do you think will be the solution to stop this uh, this process of going backwards in Venezuela in terms of rule of law? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, one more and then we will go for the answers. Right here. Thank you. Larry Luxner, news editor of the Washington Diplomat. Uh, we've heard plenty about Nicaragua, and it seems uh, very serious there. But I'm wondering uh, about the rest of Central America. Uh, Panama has the region's highest per capita income, and the uh, ex-president Martinelli is the focus of a massive um, corruption scandal. And um, we haven't heard too much about that. And what about Honduras and El Salvador, where uh, corruption in the police forces seems to be endemic? Thank you. And if I may, I will include in that Guatemala, because we are having a big, big scandal right now going on. So, Carlos Fernando. I think in Nicaragua there is a perception by the majority of the population, which are the poor, the underemployed, that this government is taking care of their needs somehow. And it has been successful in offering them a future that other governments were not capable of doing that. So the government has... Uh, gain support, that's an important issue. There is clientelism, but they, they do have political support. And there is a very small middle, cl middle class that is not, uh, is not concerned about this kind of situation. Regarding the rest of Central America, I think uh, I, I just talked to a former uh, cabinet member of uh, one of the Guatemalan governments who said to me, you know, about six months ago, we, we said, why people in Guatemala are so... Uh, completely absent. With, there is so much corruption and now see what is happening. Well, Guatemala, you have the CICIG, the International Commission for Investigating Corruption and Impunity. I think that has been a very important issue in what is happening in Guatemala. People in Honduras now, they're asking for a CICIG. In El Salvador, they would like to have that. Nicaragua probably would like to have that, but nobody I, would dare to say that. I would like to go back to, to you uh, in the final part. If when the democratic institutions, the national democratic institutions, particularly the judiciary, are not working, the CICIC example could be a, a solution. We, we, we will get back. Again, but that's a political question. You need political conditions in a country in order to have that kind of uh, yes. approval. And sometimes conditionality. Mm -hmm. World Bank, in the Inter-American Development Bank, and so many that are giving a lot of money, making very nice report about the excellent um, performance in the economic and macroeconomic, if you read the IMF reports, World Bank reports, IDB, they are praising how good Daniel Ortega is doing in the macroeconomic management. So, we not, need only, to be not only the macroeconomic, but also in terms of security. Exactly. There, there is a pragmatic, you know, relationship between what are the the, the most important interests between the region and the U.S. Well, security, trade, investment, Correct. and also uh, fighting uh, drug trafficking. Nicaragua is uh, doing very well on those issues, while on the other side, well, it's not doing very well on democracy, corruption, etc. Okay, thank you. Paulo, about uh, the question that has been asked <coughs> for, for the panel in general, or in any comment that you would like to... No, I'd like to make first my dear friend and colleague uh, Will Pomerance on international cooperation. Obviously, Brazilians are very well acquainted with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, Petrobras is under investigation. Petrobras is an American company. 
as there are 34 other um, Brazilian companies that are global companies. Many are here in the United States. One of them, a construction company, has five subsidiaries in the United States. Embraer, the airline builder, employs about 1,500 people in Florida. So uh, this integration of the Brazilian economy in, uh, into the world economy, which is uh, needed in an even bigger way, uh, uh, has put Brazilians, uh, Brazilian law in contact with the rest of the world. I think it's very positive. It puts Brazil into, it creates a highest common denominator. You have to abide by laws uh, that are here, that are in Europe, and those are positive. Brazil has had cooperation with the United States. The mutual legal assistance tr treaty that uh, has been used to prosecute corrupt people in Brazil with the help of the judiciary, the ju Justice Department here. Some of the features being used in Brazil now to prosecute the Petrobras case are derived from plea bargain agreements that is directly inspired in the American version of plea bargain agreement. Just, I want just to make one point. Brazil is making progress. Uh, it's a progress based on 30 years of work in democracy. The Constitution of Brazil, the 1888 Constitution, made the Federal Prosecutor's Office an autonomous office. It's not dependent on the just Justice Department. Okay. There were things that came. We created the, con the controller of the union job. We have, 10 years ago, created in Brazil a new level of supervision of the Supreme Court and the whole judiciary to improve court performances. There are the accounting tribunals at the federal level, at the state level, uh, that are working. They are the equivalent of the general accounting office in the United States. Mm -hmm. There is the other thing, civil service has improved in Brazil. Prosecutors in Brazil are well paid. Federal judges in Brazil are well paid. This is why you do not see uh, widespread cases of corruption, although 45 judges have been removed. Okay, so it, this is not a Pollyanna story. This is progress being made by people committed. I am glad that it's a new generation of prosecutors, people including a grand niece of mine that wants to become either a prosecutor or a judge because she sees and she sees these people er, as role models. And this is changing, I believe this is changing the culture in Brazil. This is very positive, but I don't want to give you the, long impre the, the wrong impression that we, Brazil, we dropped soccer to adopt the rule of law. No, we will <laughs> remain <laughs> struggling in soccer, but <laughs> this is hard work. This is the work of democracy. We have been at this at, for 30 years, and uh, you know, give us another 30 years, and I think we are going to do well. <laughs> it will be a different panel, I, I promise you, in 30 years. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, a, the, it's same a <laughs> the same panel, we will do our best. Alejandro, uh, yes, your question about yes, Venezuela. Very, very quickly. I mean, that's th that's an extremely difficult question. You say that the situation currently in Venezuela is uh, we see a lot of restriction of fundamental freedoms, uh, but we don't see usually what it's associated with those restrictions in other autocracies in the world, in which usually there is there is a, a control of the state. I mean, we don't see that happen. We see that in Venezuela it's still pretty chaotic uh, in the sense that it has the highest crime in, uh, uh, rates in, in Latin America and so on. Uh, I think, I mean, part obviously is that it has to come from within, from the either within the, the, the political system in Venezuela, just the opposition, even though it has been uh, just uh, restricted the country currently is quite polarized and there's a lot of supporters for the opposition but it has been uh, attacked. Part also of the problem is that Venezuela doesn't have a lot of punishment from abroad. So just Venezuela is still producing a ton amount of oil that has been sold to the world so it counts with resources uh, so which, which is actually just uh, an impediment as well. I, is that or is the completely, uh, how you can call, disengagement no lack of pressure from the international community, including the Latin America, that they don't want to take responsibility about what's going on in Good Venezuela. Point. Because oil, I think that is part of the equation. 
uh, but, but it's not the whole equation. But it's not the yes, whole equation. Right. Are, are, are we uh, accountable as a <laughs> region taking care of what is going on in, in Venezuela? Or for many years we have been just saying, okay, we have to either ignore or tolerate this? It's a, it's a good point. I think it's both. Yes. Both. Yes. Thank you. Eduardo. Daniel. <laughs> um, just to summarize a little bit, I, I think Paulo, Paulo's example about Brazil makes a case for institutional reform. No. This generation, this new generation of, of prosecutors came after the reform happened, not before the reform happened. No, this is not a caudillo problem. Mm -hmm. No, this is an institutional problem and a new generation has to take place o over institutions that are better designed. Second, I, I will say that, that Mexico, and I'm really, really happy about this, is, is leaving behind the story of uh, a lot of presidential governments, uh, especially ours, that um, corruption control was basically the logic of the Tsar because the president wanted to control his enemies, his political adversaries, uh, his own government. And we are entering, but just entering, the logic of democratic control, which is different. No? We are making institution, uh, institutions accountable to the people, not to the president. And that's a major change for Mexico, and it's going to take time, at least uh, a decade. Third, on the issue of international uh, law, which is, I think is quite relevant for countries like Mexico and for everyone right now. And I'm going to refer to my favorite international anti-corruption convention, which is, is the OECD Convention for Prosecuting uh, Corruption or Bribery in International uh, Commercial Transactions. It, Mm -hmm. There is a, a very interesting case there. A lot of countries in Latin America have, be, because they are not formally members, uh, formal members of the OECD, have adopted this convention because of the international pressure, but they never use it. And if you see some of the uh, statistics about the OECD convention, most of the cases referred to Latin American countries are, are presented and disclosed by the government of France or Germany or the US and if you see the statistics of, of those countries, they do not present these cases as cases of anti-corruption efforts locally. My best example is Mexico. No, we're talking about a dozen of cases that are being prosecuted outside. I'm pretty sure that there's something similar with Brazil in this issue. While Bra Brazil is still not a, a member of the OECD, but they have to disclose to this information, I'm pretty sure. And they, they are presented and recognized as cases in other jurisdictions, but not in the original jurisdiction. Just one single example. Pemex is right now prosecuting a case of corruption against, uh, against a major multinational company uh, in New York. But if you see the report of the OECD convention from Mexico to the OECD, it doesn't appear. So it's, it's, I think it's very powerful, but governments, they don't see, well, at least Mexican government, they don't see the power of this international uh, way of prosecuting cases for their companies and for foreign companies as a real tool in anti-corruption. They see it more like, like being part of an international club, which is the OECD, you know, and taking part of that global effort, but we don't, there is a disconnection there and it should be studied in more detail. Uh, thank you. Both uh, uh, Paulo and you, Eduardo, talk about we need more time, and I agree with that. I think that it will be uh, not realistic to ask for instant change. However, I think that we are entering into a new cycle in, in Latin America, particularly in South America and some central countries, where the economic is going down, the economic growth is going down. There are some uh, economic adjustment in, in place, like in Brazil with uh, mm -hmm. Minister Levy. Mm -hmm. And when we combine, well, you will see it also in Mexico, you saw already, but you will see more with the new Congress and the new budget. When we combine economic slowdown corruption and uh, uh, adjustment uh, uh, plans, I think that plus the people getting fed up, really fed up, uh, what you see in, in Guatemala, I just was there mm -hmm. Monday and Tuesday and what I saw in Mexico a, f a few days ago, uh, you are seeing that probably we are not going to have the luxury of saying, okay guys, we that need another 10 years or 15 years, these things takes time What's going to happen? Because uh, I think that uh, this is a, an, a, an aspect that we need to take into account, the, the timing uh, equation. 
I think that for m many years, a, a lot of people has been quite patient. In many cases, because the economy was growing, they were moving out from poverty to middle class. Uh, consume was quite high, so you were able to buy sometimes because of the economic situation, but I don't think that we are going to have that. I think that the new normal will not be a region growing at 4 or 5%, probably around 2% if we are lucky. This is going to be the worst economic year in Brazil of the last 25 years, correct, Paulo? Mm -hmm. so, uh, the economic also is knocking the door saying, guys, you have to, 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 to move. So um, as, as part of, of this reflection, I would like also now to ask you for a final remark, for closing remarks in each of the four uh, panelists. Uh, Saint is putting me pressure, but I said at the very beginning, in order to be accountable, that mm. uh, we will do our very best to be on time. So, uh, Paulo. No, just one thing. I, I think there are three things you probably can say with certain about Brazil is this one. Uh, there is no solution for Brazilian problems outside of democracy. One, Brazilian society would not accept. There is no solution for Brazil in an economic model that entails inflation, in price instability. Brazilians would not accept that. They would not vote for people. And there is now a expectation that crooks, corrupt people, politicians, etc., will be prosecuted. You put this together, I would, I'm not particularly worried about the economy, if it's coming down, if it's going up. The economy was going down and a bit up, and we redemocratized Brazil. I don't think people in Brazil involved in this are not particularly worried about that. It, what you have uh, is a mobilized society, uh, a free press, uh, people are talking, people are engaging, actually even television news television is improving in Brazil as a result of that so uh, I think uh, it is you know there is a famous author composer of my generation and the song there was a, a, a phrase that says, those in the know make their time you know you're not we're not going to ask if uh, we are going to succeed or not people believe in what they believe and they're going to go for it and there will be, there will be much tension in Brazil. There is, I start, I'm starting to see, now we are starting to see in Brazil, the pushback from the major construction companies, from this and from politicians. Let's go to battle. And uh, uh, I think that we will be successful. And as we have been, everything that was considered impossible <laughs> in Brazil in 1968, when I started university, are now public policy. Uh, democracy, economic stability, expectation of prosecution of, uh, of crooks and of corrupt people. So I think the, I see the story very much as the glass being half full, but uh, people cannot rest in their glories and their achievements because you have to keep going. Thank you very much, Paulo. Alejandro. Uh, I, I think that the, the conditions in Latin America right now are, are just, uh, as we have mentioned, we have a growing middle class, we have uh, technology, we have a very engaged civil society who is fed up. We see it in all countries in Latin America. What is necessary is to channel all those strengths into the institutional process, into creating institutions that actually respond to citizens. The challenge to me here mm -hmm. is, is how to build those institutions when uh, a lot of the political parties in Latin America are quite weak in the sense that they don't respond really to citizens' concerns. They care about their own clientele. So just how to build into the political process <coughs> these concerns. Uh, I think it, it, it requires a strong leadership from some of the few individuals that we can identify in some Latin American countries, in some cases associated to parties, in some other cases not. Uh, just this is the moment in which uh, they can actually gain a lot of support from all these masses who are fed up. Uh, but it's necessary just some leadership to actually transform that support into actual institutional reform uh, that, that endures the long term. Thank you. Are the political parties in Nicaragua, in Mexico, able to really take this challenge in terms of is there in the current political system the leadership that is needed to, to move forward? No, not in the case of Nicaragua right now. I, I look at the Central America and I think there is a positive climate of unrest and mobilization against corruption in all countries except Nicaragua. Why we don't have it in Nicaragua? 
Well, because there is this uh, functional working alliance between the government, let's say, uh, clientelistic social policies with the poor and alliance with the, with the big corporate groups and political control and also failures of the opposition. But I just wanted to finish with Guatemala, which I think will be the most important point to answer your question. Uh, there is a major move, anti-corruption movement in Guatemala these days. But we will have elections in September. And the probable winner will be Baldison. And Baldison had nothing to do with building democratic institutions. So there is no connection between the anti-corruption movement, no direct connection, and the corruption movement and building democratic institutions. It's much more complex. Thank you, Carlos Fernando. One minute because I know I see. Yeah, you mm -hmm. saw the, the message. Mm -hmm. Completely unfair, but we saw the message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the nineties, uh, Carlos Salinas was discussing something for Mexico, what, which was sequencing of reforms, no? and that was the logic in the in the nineties. So, which reform was first, and what, what was the next one? I will have to answer Daniel that at this point in Mexico, we need to to, to have more than one track for reforms. One track about the urgent things. You know, the things that gain political support, like acting against a cor corrupt politician, but also a track for the important things, no? that are going to be the, the problems in 10 years. So it's a two-track or three-track or four-track item rather than a sequencing problem. Thank you very much, our four panelists. I think a big applause.